You're listening to an irreverent podcast. Visit irreverent.fm for more content from our amazing lineup of creators. Welcome to Straight White American Jesus. My name is Brad Onishi, faculty at the University of San Francisco, and I have two return guests who many of you will will be very familiar with, and that is uh, Dr. Andrew Whitehead and Dr. Sam Perry. Many of you listening will know them from their work, their co-authored book, Taking America Back for God, which has been a kind of field-changing text when it comes to uh, discussing and analyzing Christian nationalism in the United States. You'll know them from their many other works and their co-authored articles on Christian nationalism, and I use these articles all the time in my classes on everything from the perceptions of police brutality to uh, voting patterns and all kinds of stuff. Sam has a book that came out just in the last year with Dr. Phil Gorski called The Flag and the Cross, and Andrew has numerous works, but one of them that is coming and we're all very excited about is his new book, um, American Idolatry, um, How Christian Nationalism uh, Betrays the Church. Nope, I messed it up. Andrew? Give me the subtitle. How Christian nationalism betrays the gospel and threatens the church. Betrays the gospel and threatens the church. There it is. All right. No so, worries. An- no worries. Andrew, Andrew and Sam, thanks for coming back and thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. Always a pleasure. So we're here today to talk about something I think is really important, and that is both of you uh, wrote uh, in a co-authored testimony just a wonderful outline of the impacts of Christian nationalism on the insurrection of January 6th. You were invited to do this and to submit this to the United States House of Representatives to the Select Committee uh, on January 6th. I'm looking at the, the testimony, the written testimony in front of me, and this will be available publicly uh, here going forward. We'll post the link in our show notes so people can see that. Let me just start with this. This is a, a written testimony to Congress. Most people have never done this, not a genre most people are familiar with. They don't know how it works. So would you just give us a little backstory on what happens when somebody uh, invites you to submit a testimony to Congress and, and what the, maybe what you hoped would come out of that as you did it? Right. So, I mean, it, it's, I think, being invited to, to do something like that, first, we were really excited, but it actually, I think, was a continuation of, of several conversations that we had had ongoing. There's things like with our participation in the Baptist Joint Committee, this large report that we did with uh, Jamar Tisby and Andrew Seidel and, uh, you know, and others and Captain Stewart and others uh, on Christian nationalism and its role in January 6th. Um, and we had, we had been able to interact with the House on various things and say like their Free Thought Caucus, and that's led by Jamie Raskin and other uh, House reps there. Uh, and so uh, representatives for those politicians reached out to us and they said, hey, we're gathering a lot of information about January 6th. The committee wants all of the experts that, that know anything about the kinds of things that went on there. And of course, because we had written about Christian nationalism and its role on January 6th, and we had a lot of evidence and data, we were able to contribute to I think what we felt was like a, a unique perspective that went beyond just what we could all observe uh, through video and through various pictures that were taken uh, at the Capitol. Those are certainly important and, and, and anybody who wants to can get, uh, you know, days and days worth of, uh, of story and, and footage and uh, representation there. But um, because we had lots and lots of survey data that had been collected, uh, not just uh, at one point in time, but we actually had panel data that traveled with people or that followed Americans uh, before and after the January 6th insurrection, we were able to see how attitudes changed. Uh, our unique perspective we wanted to contribute was um, the kinds of things that we witnessed at the Capitol. How pervasive are they and how are they tied to other uh, uh, really uh, noxious kinds of uh, political attitudes that I think threaten our very democracy? So we wanted to. Andrew, I'm wondering if I can ask you, you know, as you did this, uh, as Sam says, this is kind of growing organically out of the work you've been doing, the conversations you've been having, uh, the, the connections between the Baptist Joint Committee and uh, Congress uh, uh, representatives like uh, Jamie Raskin and Representative Hoffman, who's who's come to talk on this show. You know, when you did this, Andrew, I'm wondering, you know, a- as academics, we're used to kind of uh, uh, <laughs> dashed hopes, but uh, we have to try. So I'm just wondering, what 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 were you hoping might you know might come out of uh, putting all of this on paper for the committee to see? Yeah, I, you know, I think 
obviously we would hope that it would be useful to them um, and, and useful as well moving forward as we try to not only understand what happened on January 6th, but then going forward, how we can prevent or be aware um, or uh, respond back to what's happening um, out in the American public. Because um, as Sam was saying, I think our unique contribution can be, well, um, what does public survey data tell us? And that's what we do. And that's kind of our bread and butter. And, um, you know, many others were um, watching and cataloging religion, um, Christian symbolism on January 6th, um, what was there. And then I think we can show, you know, across the American public how pervasive, you know, are some of these beliefs of, um, honestly, you know, the insurrectionists as they live streamed themselves. Um, breaking into the Capitol and the words they were using, um, the terms they were using, the way that they were understanding what they were doing in real time. Um, you know, we can to an extent measure that and see that. Um, so we, we didn't collect data from the insurrectionists, but we can see, you know, what Americans kind of think and believe about the special role of um, this particular expression of Christianity in American public life. And then what is that connected to? Because Christian nationalism isn't the only explanation of January 6th, but it's an important one. Um, and there are others. And we kind of show that these things are intertwined and they're still with us. Um, and so I think that's what we were hoping would be useful um, because I think, yeah, what led to January 6th wasn't new. Um, it, this wasn't our first experience of political violence, as many people have written. Um, and it likely won't be our last because much of this is still with us. So, yeah, yeah. I think. That's some of our hope. And I, I actually, I think just following up on that, I, I think um, what a, what a, as, as you know, it, it, it didn't materialize uh, in, in terms of like uh, being able to, uh, I, I think, uh, express the contents of that testimony to a broader audience. But I think what Amanda Tyler was able to do before Congress, and she just yeah. knocked off the mark, crushed it. Uh, in terms of what she was able to present, it was coherent, it was, uh, you know, it was powerful. Uh, I think ultimately we we were hoping to get such an opportunity. The fact that uh, Amanda Tyler was able to do that uh, with her expertise, with her his awareness, her awareness of all that's going on in the field, all these different parts and pieces and contributions people have made. I think she did an excellent job. But uh, I think it's platforms like that so that we can actually have this really uh, kind of national conversation about Christian nationalism. That's uh, you know what we'd hope, and uh, she was able to do that, which it's, uh, I think we were really glad for. Yeah. And if you're listening, friends, Amanda Tyler is the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee, which is uh, an organization that fights for the separation of church and state freedom from religion in this, in the, in the sa for the sake of freedom of religion. And she's also uh, spearheading that organization's program, Christians Against Christian Nationalism. So uh, Amanda Tyler was able to actually testify before uh, Congress and, uh, and uh, as part of uh, everything we're talking about today. Well, you, the two of you really identify four main elements uh, that were influential in motivating people uh, at the insurrection. And uh, these are tied directly to Christian nationalism. So, you know, I want to give people a kind of window into the, uh, the testimony that you provided and the ways that you tie together the motivation for participating in J6 with Christian nationalism. So the first one is the big lie. And you talk about how the, the you know, the big lie is, is something we're all familiar with now. The 2020 election was stolen and the outcome was manipulated by fraud. That's the idea. One of the things I maintain in my work is that the big lie connected with Christian nationalists because they have been told something like the country has been stolen from them since the 1960s. So right. this is a group that's used to hearing it's been stolen from you. And then the big lie comes along and it just taps into all of those decades and decades of uh, people stoking the fire saying your country has been taken away from you by people who don't deserve it. So can you help us understand this? How does the big lie, according to the data, connect with uh, Christian nationalism when it comes to uh, the insurrection? Yeah, I mean, it is it is it's actually a, I mean, pretty, pretty astonishing, like how powerfully the two are related uh, with one another. So just like uh, in previous studies, we had, we had shown that Christian nationalism, even after you, Christian nationalist ideology, as we measure it with various kinds of questions about what you agree with about the federal government establishing, you know, the United States as a Christian nation or the founding documents being divinely inspired or those kinds of things. Um, just as, just as it predicts Trump's support, like for the vote, uh, it, it, it is basically associated with, uh, believing the big lie in a, in a, in what we'd call a linear 
relationship, right? Like the more one increases, the other increases. And so, but this is important. And, and what this is what something I think we try to stress in, in the testimony itself. We always want to be careful about disentangling uh, white Christian nationalism from Christian nationalism that we might that might reflect other kinds of attitudes and political views, that say, of, of Black Americans. So we, we show in the testimony that uh, as Christian nationalism increases, Black Americans, for example, are no more likely to believe the big lie. It's not something that adjusted their views in any meaningful way. But for white Americans, it basically goes from nothing to like 90%, right? Like, so in other words, at the lowest values of our Christian nationalism measure, taking into account partisanship and ideology and region of the country and education, all those things, we show that people who, who strongly disagree with Christian nationalism rejected the big lie completely. People who strongly embraced Christian nationalism were upwards around like 80 to 90 percent believe the big lie. And so it, it, it tracks so closely with belief in that and because of the things that we're talking about, adherence to conspiratorial thinking, and us versus them kind of uh, dichotomies and allegiance to sacred myths about what the nation should, should, should be and always must be. I think one of the things that surprised many people watching footage from January 6th is the ways that the rioters and the insurrectionists, police officers, because there seemed to be this understanding that at first they would be on their side. And, and this is all, you know, we can't speak for everyone who was there we, and we don't have footage of every last person, but there is just these, these clips that you, this committee has shown where there's this sense that, oh, they'll be on our side. And then when they're not, when police enforcement actually try to stop them, it's you're supposed to be on our side. And that really leads to, I think, the second element that you that you all highlight, which is this comfort with political violence. And one of the things that really sticks out for me here is that there's this idea that uh, white Christian nationalists um, are in favor of using authoritarian violence to control what are deemed to be threats and criminals and terrorists. So if we can keep connecting dots, uh, white Christian nationalists feel the country was created for them. They're the founders, supposedly. The big lie taps into the feeling that despite them founding the country, it's been taken from them. So, Andrew, how does this lead to supporting authoritarian violence to control threats and terrorists? Why would they think that, you know, for example, uh, taking over the, the Capitol and uh, occupying the Senate chamber is not an act of criminality, but an act of doing one's patriotic duty or what God wants? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, a lot of it aligns with what, what you're pointing out. When, when these lines of us versus them are drawn, and then the very fate of the country is in the balance, and then you're legitimizing that view in the will of the transcendent, the sacred, that's really powerful. And to the extent that a democratic society you know, allows you to at least feel like you have control over where the country goes or this vision of, of that you believe God has given you of what this country should look like, then that's fine. But when that begins to be blocked and they feel as though they're under attack and, you know, again, quote unquote, we are under attack and it's being taken from us, that's really powerful. And I think what we saw, you know, then and in their own words, they were ready to lay aside, you know, pluralistic democratic society. They're willing to lay aside respecting authorities if they feel these authorities are, again, blocking the will of the transcendent. So, you know, just to quote um, Jenny Cudd, so she was one of the insurrectionists, owns a florist shop in Midland, Texas. And she said, um, to me, God and country are tied. To me, they're one and the same. We were founded as a Christian country, and we see how far we've come from that. We are a godly country, and we are founded on godly principles. And if we do not have our country, nothing else matters. And so in that sense, you can see why when they felt as though um, the authorities were blocking them from enacting what they wanted to do, nothing else matters. Not respecting police, um, not the thin blue. I mean, there, there's video of them beating police officers with, you know, flagpoles that, that held thin blue line flags. And so the, the dissonance is incredible. But um, yeah, so this comfort with political violence where, um, you know, in the report, um, Sam and, and his colleague, Josh Grubbs, they collected all this wonderful data. And one of the questions they ask and, and other polling firms ask this question, too. But, um, you know, is there a time when we would have to, as American patriots, um, you know, basically move towards political violence in order to save our country? And again, there's this strong association once we account for a lot of other explanations where if you believe 
uh, you know, white Americans who embrace Christian nationalism, they're much more likely to say, yeah, we're going to have to embrace political violence in order to save our country. Um, we'll set aside whatever if it, it means that we're, you know, essentially enacting God's will for, for what we see this country should be. Sam, this takes me back to the flag and the cross where you and Phil Gorski talk about uh, three elements working together, uh, freedom, violence, uh, and order. And basically the idea is if for the white Christian nationalists, if the, the social order is not in the proper uh, alignment, then they can't experience freedom. And thus they may need to use violence to fix that. Uh, just wondering if you want to jump in here on that, on that sort of uh, trajectory when it comes to J6 and, and the approach of Christian nationalists to that day. Yeah, I mean, I think that January 6th, it, it illustrates powerfully to the, the distinction between uh, the nation and the state as it relates to like the, the imaginary of, of, of this kind of group of people. Like the nation is not the state, clearly, right? Because you can take over and you can violate, you can attack uh, the state. The state is the regime. The state is the corrupt uh, uh, establishment that is, uh, that, is, that is working in cahoots with uh, the left and the socialists and the woke and everybody who's taking the things from us. The nation, though, the, the true Americans, the patriots, those who love this country and those who want to take it back are, are those who uh, have our same story, right? Like they are, they are those who, who come from the very uh, soil of, of the nation, right? And, and they, their, their parents and fathers have shed blood. And, and, uh, and, this is, and blood is, is a powerful metaphor here, right? Like as we talk about in the flag and the cross, right? Like kind of these metaphors of uh, blood purity and bloody conquest and bloody apocalypse. And, and all of those things are tied together in a real powerful way. So I think, yeah, what we, what we witnessed on January 6th, this really, if, if you needed any more evidence that, that these folks are not patriots in the sense that we like to think of, you know, fighting for the country and all the, the things that it represents. No, it is, they are nationalists, like in, in what we would argue are white Christian nationalists or the nation is for us, by us uh, forever. Yeah. Well, this leads us to something that's really important and uh, is is element number three in in your testimony, and that yeah, that is the the element of conspiratorial thinking, and uh, it's the as you say the close affinity between Christian nationalist ideology and believing outlandish things about one's cultural and political opponents. Uh, you link this to QAnon. Uh, Paul Jup uh, has some great data that shows how uh, white evangelicals, in particular, and white Christian nationalists. Um, our adherents of QAnon in ways that uh, far outpace uh, any other demographic in the country. So, Andrew, I'm just wondering if you know if you can help us understand. And I, and I have my own um, I have my own theory about this that I'll interject here in a second. But you know why would why would conspiratorial thinking be a motivating factor to uh, act act in the way many did on January 6th uh, at the Capitol and you know, what is the appeal? Because it's, and this is a question I get all the time. Why are white Christian nationalists and, and white evangelicals so susceptible to conspiracy? What, what is that? What is baked in there that, that connects them? And so wondering uh, how that all looks from your perspective. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, broadly, some, some other work that Sam and I have done with uh, Joseph Baker, where we're looking at um, sources of authority, right? And how Americans who embrace Christian nationalism think about authority. And, and we're kind of comparing, you know, science and the institution of science compared to um, the Bible, right? And this idea of the Bible as the final authority. And we find that for Americans that embrace Christian nationalism, there is this tension where um, if you give science too much, and again, there's a long history here that's been written about really well by historians um, and, and other social scientists, but um, right, if we give too much authority to this source um, outside of the Bible, then it's a slippery slope and who knows where we'll go. And so there's just been this kind of circle the wagons and, and we believe the Bible and that's it. Now, for certain things that... Um, you know, certain topics that don't feel like there's some sort of moral component to them, then there's not an issue there, right? Like, so we can drive cars, we can use electricity, but when there's this moral component of, well, when does a human become a human or things like that, um, or, you know, uh, getting vaccines, right? Become, which is kind of strangely, but then it just turns into this moral issue. Now, all of a sudden, well, where do we go to authority? And we have to turn here. So I think in this way, it connects to conspiratorial thinking where, and I think there's some populist um, strains to this too, that Sam and Phil talk about in their uh, book, 
the flag and the cross where, um, you know, we, we don't have to turn to these authorities to tell us what to believe, but, um, within this group, we know what's best and, and we need to move forward with this. And so I think it connects to our susceptibility to conspiratorial thinking, um, because yeah, you just can't trust what, what the man or the, the people, or as Sam just said, you know, the state is telling us. Um, and so susceptibility to the big lie, even though there's no evidence. And when the lawyers are in court, they're saying, yeah, we have no evidence. You know, that doesn't matter. Um, because again, we have certain sources of authority that we can trust. And some really interesting data that was collected a little while ago, they listed some different kind of famous conspiracy theories. And you see Christian nationalism is strongly associated with every single one. And then, um, which was just beautiful, they put in uh, you know, a, a, a label of a conspiracy theory that it doesn't actually exist, the South Carolina or South Dakota crash, right? That's just not actually a conspiracy theory. And the same people are much more likely to believe that that was real. And so you can see that when you're uh, open to one or more conspiracy theories, the rest are going to follow with you. So it's it's kind of a way that they kind of enact into the world, right? They embody the world is that we can't trust this and we move towards these other things. And yeah, so I think that's where we see this really strong connection. And and it continues. PRRI just had a, a Christian nationalism survey. They did a big rollout uh, like a month ago. And and yet again, they're, they find that as they ask three different questions on QAnon, and these are, you know, really, really strongly worded questions, those believers in QAnon, a majority of them are strongly embracing or at least very sympathetic to Christian nationalism. And so again, there's this really tight connection between understanding who we are as a country and this idea that America is for us as white Christians. Um, and again, particular, you know, expression of white Christianity, right? It's not all white Christians, but, you know, very, uh, quite a few, but yeah, that it's for us and, and conspiracies are, are a big part of that as well. I, I've, uh, I've been thinking about this in terms of a kind of offense defense approach. And so conspiracies often feel like a defensive tactic, like, hey, I'm on the margins, the world's against me. And so I'm turning to these alternative explanations to give me some comfort of how the world works. You know, JFK was really assassinated by so-and-so and there was no moon landing. And and they provide a community like, hey, some other folks believe this and we all kind of feel like nobody listens to us anyway. So, hey, we'll, we'll gather together and the world won't listen. They'll laugh. But who cares? You know, with white Christian nationalists, it's like there's that defensive thing of like, yeah, we're going to gather together. And no one will believe us. But wait a minute, we founded the country and we have the authority to determine what's real and what's actual and what's true. So we're not just going to sit on the sideline and be called conspiracist and let the world kind of treat us that way. We're going to emerge offensively into the, into the public square and go take what's ours based on our understanding of what is real, true, and actual. Evidence be damned, data be damned, experts be damned, Fauci be damned, doesn't matter. Right. So um, anyway, this leads right to the fourth element, and I'll throw this to you, Sam, and that is a kind of siloed uh, media uh, context in the United States, one that really um, you know, puts people in you know, this, an echo chamber uh, where they're getting information from one place. Again, I think authority comes into that. Right. One of the things that I think that is important for me is that we could have had a situation after, um, you know, after the election and even after J6 that said, this was wrong and, and this was incited by Donald Trump. Like we could have had Fox News and mm. all of those like places you would look that said, right. guys, there's no big lie. Uh, Biden won. That's it. They were texting to each other. Fox News. <laughs> we, right. <laughs> and we know that now, right? We know that like right. Hannity and Ingram were all texting each other, but they didn't do that. So I guess what I'm what I'm driving here is so how does how does this siloed uh media ecosystem provide a motivating factor in in J6 as it's tied to Christian nationalism? Yeah, I mean, not just January 6th, but I mean I think COVID as as well and, and all the things related to that. And 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 even as, as horrible as January 6th was, I mean, like, think about like the consequences to, to COVID and, and say like vaccine conspiracies and, and, uh, and, you know, suppression of the seriousness of COVID, uh, for the sake of sowing like doubt uh, about like the Democrats and what they're trying to do and trying to wreck Trump's chances and those kinds of things. I mean, like, you know, Donald Trump should be at, at the end of the day should be arrested for so many things, but like if, 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 if for my money, <laughs> the one that sticks out of my mind is like, I, 
for for him and and all of his kind of surrogates and and that includes folks uh, in the in the information silo like to to politicize COVID in a way that so doubt about like the best ways to kind of like that, that the seriousness of the issue and I mean how many people died as a result of that kind of thing no oh, January sixth is another um we I mean we have all kinds of data and that we're certainly not the only ones who have collected that but there's this of course uh, partisan media silo, the punditry that goes on to inflame these kinds of conspiracies at the very least to, to, at the very least, if they're not explicitly advocating these kinds of conspiracies, it's the constant hum of, well, couldn't you imagine them doing something like this, right? Like, or that, 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 uh, that specter of like, where I wouldn't put it past them, right? Like, I mean, maybe they didn't do it this time, but you, you, you can imagine, right? And so it's, it's, it's that kind of, that it feeds into the conspiracy, the conspiratorial thinking, right? It's, it's the, it, it, you don't have to believe uh, the explicit details of Pizzagate or something like related to QAnon to say, oh, but, I, you know, but they are groomers, right? Like, but they are into that. You know, they, they, they would support something nefarious and horrible because it allows you to believe the, the worst, most horrible things about your political opponent and it just makes you feel affirmed in that kind of uh, hatred. And so, uh, that that goes on with the big lie. It goes on with January six. It goes on with COVID and all of the other conspiratorial kind of thing. Um, and and like you said, Brad, I think it's really important that this is it's 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 one thing that you hold kind of you you hold beliefs that don't really affect your day to day behavior in any meaningful kind of way. Like we do that all the time. Like there's all there's people around the country who who believe really outlandish, like religious things or political things that they just kind of, you know, people, uh, our, our colleague, Joseph Baker, who studies like people who, who believe in Bigfoot and like UFOs and, and yeah, they do kind of hobbyist things, right? Like they're looking for Bigfoot or whatever on the side, but, but that doesn't change how they vote. That doesn't change like whether or not they go kind of like in, in mass to go kind of commit violent acts. And we're entering this kind of territory where it's, it's now becoming normalized to walk around armed, to walk around uh, at these places and to rally in these kinds of violent ways. Um, and um, I think that's, you know, uh, obviously problematic, but it, but, it, but it should point us to something coming down the, down the road, I think. I think you're making a great point. I, uh, if you give me two or three Diet Cokes, might tell you that I, I'm not sure about LeBron James going to the Cleveland Claveneers uh, with the number one pick, a kid from <laughs> Cleveland. Uh, but you know, that I don't, I have no intention of taking that anywhere near my state capital or that has no effect on me voting. It's just what I'll probably tell you after too many Diet Cokes. Um, and so you're right. Uh, th this is different. This is like, a, it changes everything when it's, when there's violence and uh, political violence involved. Let me, um, let me go to some sort of uh, kind of conclusions um, that you draw here. And I'm going to, I'm going to read just a little bit and then throw it to both of you to respond. You say Christian nationalism was not only influential soon after the insurrection, but its influence continues to reshape in real time how Americans are thinking about the insurrection. By August of 2021, 52% of those same white Americans in the top quartile uh, and 58% of those in the second highest quartile now agreed with uh, that the protesters should be arrested. Thus, not only were white Americans who subscribed to Christian nationalism initially more sympathetic toward the rioters, they quickly became more so roughly uh, within roughly a half a year. Uh, if you're listening, and that was a lot, the, the gist of that is, is that as time goes on, more and more people have become uh, more sympathetic toward the rioters. And I point this out in my book that um, as time's gone on, the big lie and the sympathy for those involved in J6 has only become more expansive. It has not dwindled. It has not evaporated. Um, and I kind of think of this as myth-making in real time, that you're able to make this myth of J6 right in front of our eyes. Like we all know about myths of Thanksgiving or myths of the, you know, I cannot uh, lie, I cut down the apple tree or myths of whatever may be. But this happened. And then in front of our eyes, it was like, oh, no, no, J6 was the, it was a Antifa. It was, uh, it was um, a normal, normal tourist visit. It wasn't that big a deal, whatever may be. So I'm just wondering, you know, as as those who gathered the the data and have uh, kind of reflected on it, what does it mean to you that in the in the period since J six, uh, it seems there's more sympathy toward the rioters, uh, and what that means for our public square? So, Andrew, what do you think? 
Yeah, I think, you know, this was really um, pretty brilliant, you know, with Sam and, and Josh as they gathered this data to do it February, right at, you know, a month after the insurrection and then six months later in August. And yeah, in the report, you can just see the drop among those that embrace Christian nationalism. You know, they're twenty uh, percent more of them are at least sympathetic to to the rioters and insurrectionists, and so you know I think too this highlights how intertwined all those other elements are with Christian nationalism because a part of it is the media landscape. I mean, you had um, where they went for news consistently saying that this was not what everybody's saying it is. Right, there was no violence there. Uh, it was not an insurrection. It, you know, even today still they're saying it was just a peaceful tour, right, of of what took place, and so. Um, as we show Christian nationalism is so tightly intertwined with these different elements, it stands to reason that one of the implications of that is this redefinition. And yeah, but I think your book and then you had your op-ed in the New York Times of, you know, drawing these similarities between the lost cause um, and the Civil War. So the South lost the, you know, the battle of the, of the war itself, but then in the court of public opinion, it won. Um, and that those implications are still with us. And I think you know, what we're seeing today is, is the same because, um, you know, these are uh, surveys of the American public. It's not of the people that were at January 6th, but it's, these are from the people in those communities and congregations that rioters and insurrectionists went home to. And we can see that they, for the most part, um, went home to places where, if, you know, these folks embrace Christian nationalism, they're, they're pretty much okay with what happened there. Um, and so we, yeah, we see that uh, taking place in, in real time. And so those implications, I think, are um, real because even soon after the insurrection, the Republican National Committee even said that, um, you know, that was legitimate political discourse, yeah. what we saw. And I mean, so normalizing that is, is truly uh, worrying um, and should be truly worrying. And then, too, it degrades, you know, some of the functioning of um, uh, the, you know, forms of government as we go on. Right. So if somebody, I don't, you know, I'm just speaking offhand here, hypothetically, um, quote unquote, but say somebody commits crimes and, and the justice department needs to arrest them. Um, if we delegitimize anything that the state does, um, then of course that is, is too, um, you know, problematic. And so, uh, it's, yeah, you know, a social scientist sitting here, it's, um, pretty wild to see. But then as citizens, right, it's, it's truly worrying um, when there is no actual reality, right? It's all just whatever your group says it is. Um, and so that's what we see taking place, I think. Well, one of the things that uh, you say numerous times in the testimony is that uh, Christian nationalism provides ideological cover or theological cover uh, for these motivations. And I'm wondering, Sam, if, yeah, just thinking about how sympathy for J6 writers has grown if that theological cover plays into it in your mind. Yeah, I mean, it becomes a, uh, we're watching, like you said, kind of a mismaking in real time. It's a, it's a lost cause theology that we are, we are watching, like be, we, watching be created, right? Like it's, uh, it is a, the, the, the protesters are being ennobled as, as, or are being kind of like, not deified, but like uh, celebrated as patriots who are just kind of like, you know, uh, doing, doing, uh, doing patriotic things. I mean, I think what, what was one, one author, uh, we were talking about this on social media a couple, couple weeks back, like some, some author on, uh, for the American conservative called them like voter integrity, uh, demonstrations for, for, but it was something to that effect, you know, like, but even renaming it, right? Like, don't, no, don't want to call it a capital riots. Don't want to call it the, you know, the insurrection, right? Like, uh, you want to call it, you know, voter integrity protests or something like that. And, and um, I, I, I do think, the, the Christian nationalist myth provides this kind of justification for whatever you want to do. If it is our country rightfully, if God bless the nation because of our values, people like us, uh, then, then, it, then, then, then it is by definition, when we take it back, even with violence, it is God's work. It is God blessing. I mean, so going back to the QAnon shaman's prayer, right? Like they had stormed the Capitol violently and he's saying this prayer in the middle of the Senate chamber and he thanks God, not, not praying, not asking. He's not petitioning. He's, he's thanking God for, uh, for, you know, uh, allowing them uh, to be in that chamber and, and, and for giving a victory for, for America being reborn that day, right? Like it's, it's all, almost like it had happened. He's claiming it. Um, and so, I mean, I think Christian nationalist theology uh, that political theology that uh, that you know it 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 uh, eliminates any kind of question to the contrary. You couldn't possibly be out of God's will because 
as we all know, this is uh, this is this is our country for us, and and it's been taken by uh, Satan and demonic forces. So we got to take it back. Well, we're going to run out of time, and we we have a really big question to ask, and that's not about what's in the report, but about what did not happen. Not report, but testimony. That's about what what did not happen with the testimony. Um, so many observers, including myself and and both of you, uh, have noted that the J six Select Committee's report does not mention Christian nationalism. Uh, they did not take up, uh, it seems, uh, your testimony in a way that made it into the final report, at least in terms of being cited or referenced. Um, so I'll leave it to you. Uh, you know, I guess qu first question is, any idea why they would not do that after uh, petitioning your testimony? And I think the follow-up would be, you know, what are the ramifications of not mentioning Christian nationalism? Because as as both of you and many of our colleagues and all of us who are uh, observing and analyzing this uh, have tried to point out, Christian nationalism was an in integral factor at J6, and yet it's not mentioned. So uh, why do you think they left it out? What are the ramifications of doing so? Yeah, I mean, so in some of the reports that I've read and, and some of the response to, um, yeah, so the report comes out and then some of the responses to that saying, why isn't religion highlighted more or Christian nationalism explicitly uh, you know, noted? And um, spokes, you know, people for the, those running the committee said, you know, we, we don't want there to be this um, viewpoint that any American that believes God is um, blessed this country is labeled a white supremacist. Um, and so they were, you know, fearful that talking about Christian nationalism would alienate right? Christians in America. And so I think there was some of that, which, um, you know, in our work, we're careful to highlight that Christian nationalism is not um, Christianity writ large, right? It's a particular expression that then, you know, really um, underscores this political ideology and is forceful in that sense. Um, and so it isn't as though um, every single American Christian, you know, subscribes to Christian nationalism, but yet it is very prevalent within American Christianity, right? So there's a tension there. Both can be true. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the dangers of not mentioning it um, is that, and, and the committee, you know, was very kind of forthright that they wanted to focus on Trump and how Trump really was the driver and, and played the key role in everything that happened. And I think that's great. Like, we should do that. Um, but what laid the groundwork for Trump? You know, Christian nationalism is a part of that story. And it's going to be here after Trump. So Trump wasn't just something that happened, right? But he's really an endpoint of an ongoing, um, and, you know, Brad, in your work, and Sam and Phil in um, their book, and, and even our book, we highlight how this is decades and centuries, right, in the making. Right. Um, and Trump really is the um, kind of the culmination of that. And he's, long after he's gone, it's still going to be powerful. And so I think in that sense, that's kind of the opportunity that was missed to give kind of this broader clarity um, and showing that um, this is part of, the body politic and it's still with us and so we ignore it really it just kind of makes us blind to the next person that will come and maybe is more disciplined you know wants to do the exact same stuff as trump but is just a bit more disciplined and and that i think is is a threat that's still with us and i hope that we can meet the moment but we won't if we're going to ignore these different elements and christian nationalism is a part of that yeah i'll, I'll end with uh something kind of provocative i think uh you know i think the uh uh, it, in, uh, in his book, Black Reconstruction in America, Du Bois has this wonderful chapter on the propaganda of history. And he, and he talks about how um, whites in the North were complicit in this kind of uh, uh, retelling of, of the Civil War as not about slavery, but it was about whatever. Uh, and, and they did that, he said, because they wanted to make peace and they, you know, and it was kind of a capitulation and, and like, hey, let's not make waves. Let's not like wave the bloody shirt and like, let's kind of... You know, but he says you 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 actually like you know uh, you you allowed uh, this real history to be erased uh, and the motives behind the Civil War of, of a whole group of people to be kind of like you know just glossed over. Um, I think the January Sixth Committee not acknowledging that Christian nationalism played a role in this and and, and was a motivation, uh, if not explicitly laying the the foundation of this kind of uprising like Andrew was talking about. I think it's. It's the equivalent, right? It's the it's the equivalent of, and not in proportion. Like I, I want to have proportionality here, but like, but it is it is the the intellectual equivalent of of saying let's let's 
kind of completely ignore this this foundational ideology that motivated a lot of all of this. It still does. Um, because we just don't want to make waves. I feel like it's a capitulation that, that ultimately comes back to haunt us, uh, as Du Bois uh, uh, so beautifully said, right? Like, uh, bad history is still bad history, right? Like, it's, it's and this is uh, a case of glossing over a pretty important part of the story. And so uh, we hope to be able to, to magnify, to amplify that in, in some way. That's a great comparison. And it's just a great frame of reference to think about uh, the consequences and the ways that uh, history is shaped by documents like these and what is uh, included and what is not. And uh, so anyway, a um, lot to think about there. Um, just appreciate uh, your insights and uh, your willingness to to come on and just talk about your testimony. Uh, as we said, friends, we're going to post the link in the show notes so you can read that testimony for yourselves. It will be uh, made public. And so uh, it uh, it's all out there in the open. Uh, for my money, I'll just say real quick, um, you know, to me, this is an example of, uh, Andrew, you said that people, you know, there was reports of of being afraid of of, of painting all God-believing Americans as white supremacists. And once again, you know, white evangelicalism, white Christian nationalism, white Christianity, and I, and I don't want to make white evangelicalism and white Christian nationalism synonymous, but what I do want to do is say that there's this sense of American religion is the conservative white Christian. Mm. And right. if we somehow criticize that, we're criticizing American religion or we're criticizing Christianity as a whole. And so the fear is, well, we can't say anything about that group. Otherwise, uh, you know, the entirety of uh, the American religious uh, population will be offended and, and we will just get lambasted from Fox News and from everyone else about being God-hating uh, uh, people who, uh, who are, are anti-religion. I, I will note, and I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a you you, you have a quote from Billy, uh, Franklin Graham early on in the testimony, and it struck me that uh, you know you were making this wonderful point, and it all makes sense in the testimony that Franklin Graham's comments fit perfectly in the theological matrix that ties together Christian nationalism J six, but here's Franklin Graham, the very prominent son of Billy Graham, the man who was counsel to eight presidents or so, and. I can just see the wheels turning in, I'm not going to name names, but just certain people on the committee thinking, if it comes out that I cite testimony where Franklin Graham is present, does that mean I'm haranguing Billy Graham? And does that mean that going back to uh, all the, uh, the, the long and, and wide reach of the Grahams and what they mean to American Christianity that I've done that? No, I'm, I'm just not going to go there. And while one can get their head around that logic, it's cowardly. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It just is. And it really leaves out an important part of the story. So anyway, more Diet Coke, and you might get the names of the people on the committee I'm thinking about someday. Yeah. All right. Andrew Whitehead, Associate Professor of Sociology at Uwe Pui, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indiana. And then Sam Perry, Associate Professor of Sociology at University of Oklahoma. Thanks to both of you. Just real quick, where can people link up with you all? I know most people listening will be familiar, but if they want to find you, where's the best place? Twitter and Instagram. I try to stay, try to stay up with both of those. And uh, yeah, so that's great. Yeah, same Twitter. That's okay. Great. And Andrew's new book is coming out here uh, this summer. So we'll hope to have him back uh, when it drops and just be on the lookout for that. Promises to be really, really, really good. As always, find me at Bradley Onishi. Find us at Straight White JC. Go to our new website and you can search episodes so you can find stuff and you won't have to email me and ask me when I said that and have me email you back and say, I have no idea. So do that. Check us out on Patreon and can always use your help there. Other than that, we'll be back later this week with It's in the Code and the Weekly Roundup. But for now, we'll say thanks for being here. Have a good day. This has been an Irreverent Media Podcast.